Brother Muhammad, welcome. I never knew TV. We give thanks for coming out here. Um, yeah. Before we get into it, right, <laughs> please share with the people your experience in Jamaica. Oh, brother, it was one of the uh, greatest experiences of my life. I was blessed to be interviewed by the living legend, Brother Muda Baruka. Uh, we were able to share the airwaves together and build in a public setting. Uh, spoke at Holly Selassie High School and uh, the General Penitentiary. A whole different experience. <laughs> Please tell us about your experience going to GP. Well, it was uh, we we had it end up being great. You know, there's a there's a verse in the Bible that says that all things work for the good for those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Uh, when we first got there, the uh, warden, I don't know what his title would be there, but he was uh, a little resistant to us coming inside of the institution and uh, debriefed me in an aggressive way and came to where we had the soldiers gathered for the men's uh, meeting in the penitentiary, brought me on, get, laid the ground rules and made his military walk out and before he left, uh, he stopped and just stayed and listened and came back and told the brothers that I feel so powerful right now. And I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to broadcast Minister Farrakhan's address to the whole penitentiary tomorrow. So it was a great victory that those, uh, you know, those forgotten soldiers that are behind those walls in the belly of the beast were able to get touched, one, by a, their stu a student, and then, of course, the next day by the teacher that taught that student. I uh, spoke at the uh, Liberty Hall on the 100th anniversary of the UNIA and got a chance to meet the oldest living uh, member of the UNIA, a sister that was, at that time, a few years ago, 95, uh, years of age, still with the spirit of a warrior and a soldier. So we had a we had a great trip, and I I can't wait to get back and uh, put boots back on the ground in Kingston and the other parts of Jamaica to free that great great nation. Uh, do you remember the powerful message that you gave to him at General Penitentiary? It was dealing with the uh, concept of manhood from Scripture. Uh, we kind of laid a base to let the brothers know um, that do not allow yourself to take any self-image or any other perception from non-scriptural concepts. They agreed. So we were able to show what a real man looks like by breaking down the Lord's Prayer and showing that the Lord's Prayer is not some invisible request that you send in outer space with your eyes closed at night on your knees, but inside the Lord's Prayer, we learned it from the minister, is a description of what an ideal man looks like. So once we start building on how to become our Father who art in heaven, heaven is up, someone that, that women and children can respect and honor. Hallowed be thy name, that means that you gotta have an honorable and a noble reputation if you're gonna be a real man. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Real men don't hope and wish, real men will things into existence. Give us this day our daily bread. We told him, well, hey, if you're working for the enemy, the white man, he'd give you weekly or bi-weekly bread. That's money. But if you want daily bread, you got to be in business for yourself. Uh, you know, and we went down the math of the, the entire uh, prayer as fundamental characteristics of manhood and taught how we could, could manifest that. And the soldiers uh, were in agreement and we had a 100% consensus that we were going to strive to become those kind of men in those walls and as soon as God blessed them to put their foot back in the streets. All right, I heard your story about your girlfriend at the time being pulled to the teachings of the Nation of Islam. Um, yeah. What was it about the Nation of Islam which moved you to join and change your life? Well, you know, as you just said, my, my girlfriend, uh, we had been together since we were 14 years of age uh, as boyfriend and girlfriend. And for any of you in the viewing audience watching this that are young, do not try this at home. I do not recommend this formula. 97% of all high school sweethearts never become husbands and wives. So be careful. 
be careful. We just happen to become the exception instead of the, the rule. But she, her father wasn't in the nation but he was what we would call a supporter or a sympathizer, always donated, always studied red, came to events, uh, and was taking them, her and her twin brother, to hear the minister ever since they were four years old, every year. So it was, it was being installed into her subconscious mind, this wisdom. So when she reached the age of a teenager and began transferring from girl into woman, the uh, wisdom that was poured in her as a child became activated to help her to navigate and make decisions. She got interested, gave me a message to the black man, two tapes by the minister. I, I never listened to them, never read the book, uh, but she kept talking about it. So as a result, uh, I said, I got to read it. And when I picked up that book, Message to the Black Man, my word is bond. When I opened it up, first page, I said, this is how I've been believing all of my life. I just didn't know how to say it like this. And so um, I kept diving deep and studying that and listening to those uh, lectures, 17 years of age. Uh, I was in the streets, coming out of the streets, and I didn't know anything to get right but go to church, tried to go to church. I went to Sunday school. Bible studies, morning service, evening service, weekday service. I did everything you could do in the church, but I didn't feel like I was getting the strength to resist the pull of the streets. And anybody that's ever hustled, you know it's just as hard to stop selling as it is to stop using. One's a fiend for the drug itself, the other's a fiend for the money that comes when you're selling that dope. And I was on the other side uh, of the equation. But whenever I start reading that message to the black man, I start getting strength. Was it the... Uh discipline that they preached that, that kind of grabbed you it it wasn't that was the turn off in my mind i was like man looking from the outside in this this thing man this muslim thing look a little too hard man i don't know if, i don't know if i want to i said you know i said i said you know what after i play around for a couple more years i'm gonna go ahead and join but it was it was the wisdom it was the insight it was being able to explain uh, questions that I had in my mind all my life. I tried to ask those questions of my grandparents and uh, deacons at the church, Sunday school teachers, and they always would tell me, you know, boy, don't you question God. You just got to have faith. You just got to believe. But I came in contact with the teachings, and I learned that that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to ask questions. In fact, Jesus said it like this. Ask, and you shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. Ask, seek, knock. You take the first letter of each one of those words, it spells ask again. So you're supposed to be questioning God. So they, when I learned, studied the teachings, uh, I didn't have to ask it. The answers were, were there. And I loved the concept that every other spiritual system that I had ever heard about teaches to worship God, believe in God, Praise God, pray to God, honor God, but none of them taught you that you could become the God you believe in except the honorable Elijah Muhammad. And that was the magnetic concept that drew me in. I didn't want to just believe in God. I wanted a spiritual system that would train me to become the God I believed in, and that is what the Nation of Islam is. Can you tell us about the origins of the fruit of Islam, also known as FOI? And where did the idea come from to structure it like the military? Well, the fruit of Islam is the name given to the military training of the men who belong to Islam in North America. This uh, system of disciplined military training inside of a divine uh, system was born out of the founder of the Nation of Islam, Master Fahd Muhammad, the one that came from Mecca traveled 9,000 miles by himself and came to Detroit, found the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and taught him. This is a man we believe that God intervened uh, in our affairs in his person. And so he is the establisher uh, of the, the, not just the message, but the method, not just the word that we teach, but the way. He's not just given us the consciousness, he also gave us a, a culture. He didn't give us just language, he gave us law. And inside of that, that language and law, or law, 
inside of that method is the structure of manhood training, military training, spiritual training, economic development on both sides, the male and the female. So the FOI uh, is really any male member that has accepted the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You come under that spiritual military training to become a soldier for God in the army of Allah. Why is the FOI so successful in turning men around? Well, there's an old saying that you can't heal what you do not feel. And, and it is out of that concept that when you unpack the variables of both Bible and Holy Quran, very rarely are messengers sent. They're almost always raised. Why? Because when you raise someone to be a messenger from among a people that went through the same hell that you're catching, but yet became who he is, then it, it, it destroys the excuse mechanism in your brain that you can't do it too. So what makes us, I think, so effective is that one, we weren't sent from another country. We're raised from the streets just like our brothers are in the streets. And the fact that we came up and caught the same hell at the same place, at the same time from the same enemy, they're catching hell. Yet in the midst of that, we can be sane, sober, respectful, honorable, and disciplined. It lets them know that, that they can do it too. So because we are and were once them, it makes them to know that if, if you were once me and you became what I'm looking at, then I too can do it as well. So that's part. And then, of course, uh, Master Father Muhammad told us that it's going to take more than just teaching to raise us. And on one side, that's, that's chastisement from God to get us correct. But on, a, on the proactive side, it's the kind of love that you're supposed to show your brothers. So, so we are taught that you're not a Muslim until you love, desire, or want for your brother what you love, desire, and want for yourself. We're taught that brother, base word of brother is other. Your brother is your other self. So whatever you want done to you, you got to be found doing it to your other self, your other you. So because of that concept, we operate uh, with, a, with a certain kind of love for our brothers, like the love we have for ourselves. So we don't, we, we, we're more invested in trying to snatch the brother, hold the brother, get him from the clutches of Satan, walk him through a process that he can become the great man he's born, born to be. Do you think this, uh, the previous generation was easier to, I don't want to say mold, but guide in the new direction versus this new generation? It, t to some extent, you know, to some extent, because these new weapons of mass distraction are greater than what they were uh, in the times past. However, you know, scripture says this, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. So whenever a harvest is ripe, it's ready for the picking. It's our job to be better laborers and work harder to get them. And I think that because of more distractions being present, it makes it more challenging. But what, what does it say in physics? For every action there is in nature, there is in nature is equal and opposite reaction. So yeah, there is more distraction, but there also is more information available. Just in my little time on the planet, when I wanted to get knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to be able to go out and try to teach and inspire somebody, I had to go dig in books. I had to get an encyclopedia set. I had to go to the library, spend six, eight hours flipping through index cards, writing down hand notes. But now you can pull out your phone and just say, you don't even have to type, just tell Google. So, so we, we have no excuse. Yes, there are more distractions available to this generation than it was the last, but there's also easier access to gain more knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in our generation than it was in the past. So our job as the laborers, as the saviors, is to employ that equal and opposite reaction and use access to knowledge to equalize or neutralize the distraction. And I think we, we have no excuse. We should be able to get them just as fast 
as we used to get them in the 50s and 60s. So uh, the answer is yes and no. All right. You advocate for mental, spiritual, physical and financial health. Too many times people leave out the financial health part. Right. Um, mm -hmm. When did you start to become financially literate? and be more disciplined and strategic in your spending habits? Well, I, I, I learned uh, from, the, from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that, that man uh, is to be a well-rounded and, well, and, and totally developed human being if we're going to be considered alive. And he shared a verse that I had heard growing up but never seen it broke down or unpacked. And most of us have heard where in the first John it says that above all things, brethren, I wish that you would prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prospereth. So there's three categories of greatness that the Lord of the worlds is looking for us to operate in. Health, wealth, and spiritual development. Now, if that verse says even as thy soul prospereth, is saying, in addition to working on your soul, you got to work on your pocket. In addition to working on your soul, you got to work on your health. Or even if we're saying that something is even with in, in distance, or even in height, we're saying it's at the same level. So whatever level that we are striving to get our soul we should be striving to get our health and our wealth to that same uh, category. Uh, I learned, too, from the minister. There's a verse in uh, Matthew uh, 16, 24, I believe, where we're listening to this. It says that the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. I said, man, that's a pretty sad state to be in. Here you got in your mind. Everything you need, you got the, the inspiration, you got the passion, you got the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding. But because you are unhealthy, the flesh is is unable to even carry in the practice. So we have to be we have to make sure that that we keep this this temple, this tool of the living God in good operating condition so that when we have a vision, when we have passion, when we have an idea, when we have that knowledge we want to bring into existence, we actually have a body that can be utilized uh, to make it happen. So that's kind of uh, the, the, the dynamic for the, 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 the health side and then, and then the wealth side. Uh, I learned this too. There's a verse in the Bible in Ecclesiastes 1019. Reverend don't teach it a lot, but they show living it. Listen to this. It says, a feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh one merry, but money answereth all things. That's, the Lord said that. So, you know, this concept of uh, being disconnected from the acquisition uh, of wealth is not divine. It's a man-made uh, concept that has been used by people that want to make an excuse that if they go after money that they're going to lose God. No, but Jesus said it like this. He said, if any man be my disciple, he must do three things. Number one, deny himself. Last thing was follow me. But look at this. And, but pick up your cross. And if you look at a cross, a cross is a long vertical line with a shorter horizontal line. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us that everything that is of the material world is on the horizontal, but everything of the mental and the spiritual world is on the vertical. So if you're picking up a cross, long vertical, that means I got to make sure I got more spiritual than I have material, but I still got to have some material. What Jesus is saying is nothing wrong with getting rich as long as you make sure you got more righteousness than you got riches. Nothing wrong with getting you some money as long as you got more morals than you have money. Nothing wrong with getting you the dollar, but just make sure you got a better connection to Allah than you do to that dollar. So you're supposed to have them both. That's what the cross uh, really should uh, represent in that concept. And I learned that breakdown from the minister. And because of that, 
uh, I've lived life uh, a long time without it, and I've lived a short time with it, and I do like living with it much better than I like living without it. Have you noticed also through your teachings and working with people that uh, the mindset that's developed when you grow up in poverty, I see it as a cop out in a sense because you say people say I don't want money or they just view success as wealth and wealth as just an evil thing. Do you feel that um, your environment, can you change your mind when you grow up in an environment where people have disdain for success and wealth because they can't attain it? Well, of course you can. See, the, the minister said this. He said, whoever gives you the diameter of your knowledge prescribes the circumference of your activity. So the danger with us, we, like now, we live on a planet. The planet is 24,896 miles in circumference. Why? Because the diameter is 7,926 miles in diameter. If you made the diameter longer, the Earth's circumference will be bigger. Our problem is, is that whenever we are constantly regurgitating in the hood, the same madness, the same excuses, the same spookism, the same relationship with work uh, uh, success, then we, we are only operating with a certain kind of diameter of knowledge that produces a certain kind of circumference of activity. Well, what we've done and has happened to us is that we came from that same little short diameter of knowledge that we were taught uh, by our family members, but we were expanded with a new diameter of knowledge that came from the teachings that in turn, what did it do? It expanded and made our circumference of activity greater. So the only way you can be wealthy is your circumference of activity uh, has to be greater. There's no cheat code. There, there's no hack. There's no, there's no jailbreak. There's no, there's no trick. There's no ghost coming from out of the sky that's going to make everything. Uh, success is a campaign of discipline. So if you're not willing to work hard, work smart, and work for a long period of time, then you will never be able to be uh, successful. So we learn that uh, by having our diameter of knowledge expanded by the wisdom and teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So we broke that mold of, uh, of what you are, are speaking of as a, a poverty mindset. Uh, they call it in church, they say it's a generational curse. But generational curses are not passed on through uh, just living and being around somebody with the same last name. Generational curses are the repetition of bad habits that, that existed in the family or the friends or the neighborhood that you was in. When you change those habits, then you change your curse. So there, there is no generational curse that comes just from osmosis. It's, an, it's a learned behavior. So we, we unlearn it by having our diameter of knowledge uh, expanded and, and anyone can do the same thing. Please explain to the viewers why you say Islam is not a religion, it's a way of life. Islam is not a religion, it is a way of life. First of all, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said it, why did he say it? Because religion, and like any other term, it has two definitions. It has connotation and denotation. Connotation is the commonly accepted definition, meaning however people use the word, that is connotation. But denotation is the actual definition when you break down the etymology of it. Most people, when they think religion, they don't use denotation. They use connotation, commonly accepted. And religion in this world has been something that you put on on Sunday and you take off on Monday. So most people are the regular uh, savage Negro six days a week and then now they become when they put on the outfit a religious person on that Sunday So the most honorable Elijah Muhammad he's going to war With that kind of mentality because it does not work for transformation of human life And it will not work for man to gain the favor of God and become what he believes in So once you say Islam is not a religion, but it is a way of life it changes your concept, your connotation for your expression. It's not a, a bow tie and suit on practice. It's not a head covering and a jalabia. It's not, not outfit, it's not Sunday, it's not Friday prayer. 
if it's a way of life and life is all the time, then it's something I take with me everywhere I go. So I bring Islam with me in the kitchen when I'm cooking food. That's why no pork is on my plate. I bring I bring Islam with me whenever I'm doing business transaction. That's why I treat other people the way I want to be treated. So once you make it a way of life, then it becomes a spiritual system that you use to govern your behavior in all categories. The denotation of religion, the, the word religion, prefix re, means to do again. Religion comes from the Greek meaning to get to God. So religion is supposed to be a spiritual system that gets you back into being one with God. Well, that presupposes that we once were with God if we got to get back to being with him. So whenever a spiritual system tells you that come join and you can become a believer, come join, you will be a worshiper, come join, you can be an apostle, you can be a saint, come, you can be a companion, you can be a prophet. That's not the real goal of religion. The goal of religion is not for man to go back into sainthood or apostleship. The goal of religion is to get back to God. The goal of religion should be a spiritual system that makes you into a God. So the only way that that can happen is if we allow Islam, the teachings, the practice, the morals, the ethics, the law to be with us, not on Sunday morning when we go to celebrate at the building, but every day of our life when we uh, uh, move around in the world and do what we do. So it should affect business. It should, it should affect parenting. It should affect the car you drive, the way you drive. It should affect the food you eat. It's a way of life not a religion. It's not something you put on and take off. It's something that you wear all the time as your infant, not your outfit. All right. Uh, what's the greatest lesson you have learned from Minister Farrakhan? I know that's a hard one. Man, man that's very fun. hard. Because well, you could break it down to two also. I could say that the, what makes it so challenging is that, you know, Allah God has, according to the Holy Quran, 99 chief attributes and we've been taught by the minister that every attribute of God is also a human characteristic. So that's what the concept you read in the Bible where it says man is in the image and likeness of God. Image is a physical reflection, likeness is a spiritual reflection. Likeness, so teaches the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, means that you're created in the same mind, same nature, and character of the God. So, so we all have the 99 attributes of God, all of their, their human characteristics. Some of them we manifest naturally, but some of them we have to learn and acquire and practice and get better at. The beauty of the minister, in my humble opinion, is he's the, the living proof that not one or two, but all 99 can be manifest in perfect balance. So it's hard to say a lesson that you get other than to say uh, the greatest thing is the fact that his beingness, the way he is, proves that we can become who Allah promised us that we can become. The minister's all God all the time. And he uh, manifests those characteristics and those attributes of God in, in perfect balance. He's compassionate, he's merciful, but he's, he's still warrior, he's soldier. So everything that you're looking for, uh, God has blessed him to become that. So he's that developed model uh, of a human being. I always joke about it and say that, you know, life is a test and everybody bears witness that it is. And I remember when we were in school and you had to take a test, when you were taking a test, uh, all of the problems on the test were all different, but every now and then they would put an example at the top of the page. It wasn't the exact question, but it was the formula you needed to work to solve all the questions. The minister, being a servant of God, being one raised by God for us, he said at the top of the page of life as an example, giving us the formula on how to solve all the different problems that we'll come up with. So in that sense, I would say he's the example for everything. You know, he's really, he's the man that taught me everything that I know and is the example of the man that I hope to one day become. And he's that for, for all of us. 
All right. Um, did Farrakhan ever share how he accumulated so much information? Well, the minister uh, was a great student of the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And uh, his life, when you listen to the way he operated, his prayer, study habits, pretty much if he wasn't swinging the sword, he was sharpening the sword. Swinging the sword meaning teaching. And if he wasn't teaching, he was studying uh, to teach. Uh, he talks about, uh, as he grew up as a young minister, he didn't spend a lot of time uh, catching balls with his children and doing the traditional parenting thing. He was always in the lab, always studying, always teaching, uh, and making sure that when he did teach, he had something to teach. So that kind of, of habits, which of course he credits his mother for, for getting him involved in the study of the mastery of the most difficult instrument in the world to play the violin. And by taking him young and committing him to that kind of discipline to become proficient in the hardest instrument, set his mind up that he could become proficient in the hardest job ever given to man, which is the resurrection of black people. So he, of his own statement, he brought that same uh, formula for mastering the violin, he brought it to mastering the teachings and put in that same kind of effort and energy he used to put into becoming proficient at playing the violin to saving uh, his people. So that is, that is the regimen. Uh, and he told us now, now, for anyone that's viewing this, you don't have to study eight to 10 hours a day to become what you, you are to become. One of our lessons say this, that the above can be accomplished with very little study. So it's not a whole lot of study, but it's a lot of acting, a lot of working, a lot of living the life that's necessary. So uh, the minister said this, he said, knowledge allows you to equalize the pressure that life imposes on man. So, so the more knowledge you have, the better you're able to solve problems. The better you're able to solve problems, the less stress you have. He said that all you need to do in order for you to have in your head the adequate amount of interior knowledge to push off and ward off the pressure of this world is one hour a day of study. Do you know, Brother Lynn, that, that, that there's 14.7 pounds of atmospheric pressure per square inch of the human body right now on us? Think about all that, but look how easy it is to move. And the reason why that pressure doesn't cause us to implode is because we have more oxygen going out than we have the pressure of air coming on us. Well, spiritually, for every physical law there is in the universe, there is in nature a spiritual counterpart. So when the pressures of the world are coming, the oxygen is knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the better you're able to equalize the pressure of the world and you can walk and just exhale and not feel the pressure of the world when your head is full of knowledge. That was the minister's way to become who he is, to teach what he teaches. But our formula, he said, you just need an hour a day and you'll have what you need in your mind as the adequate spiritual raw material to deal with the pressures of life without imploding. And the last one, um, has Farrakhan ever given you advice about public speaking? Yes. Yes. And the minister, of course, uh, you know, the greatest the greatest advice is just him teaching. You watch him teach and you strive to duplicate the way that he does it. There's never been, uh, in my humble opinion, one that can communicate an idea greater than the minister. This is the greatest teacher that that, that I've ever seen or ever heard in my life period, hands down, any generation of time. So studying his way is number one. But every now and then, uh, whenever uh, I teach, if I'm representing him or I'm just representing uh, at the mosque, he gets it and he'll listen and he'll give uh, points of correction, ways to do different things. Uh, so yes, he, he, does, he does help. Uh, train me up and tune, tune me up, and he does that for many. That's super dope. Uh, what is your 
what is your what do you believe you improved the most on in regards to your oratory skills from starting out till now? I, I would probably um, say that you you every time you teach, you learn different messages and ways to deliver the message that that create the best effect. Uh, and I'm not talking about applause. I'm talking about what was taught and how was it taught that produced a person to take it in, absorb it, and act on it and come back months later and give a report that I've been operating on that idea and it's produced these positive results. So those points that we learn from feedback uh, caused me to say, well, man, well, what did I do that made that stick? Okay, so I had three Bible verses, two Quran verses, two examples from nature, and one thing from personal experience. So what I need to do, I need to make sure that if I really want some a point to go, I got to make sure I stack it with all of the scriptural and the scientific and the experience examples to make it stick and stay. So, so learning, learning that, and of course, you know, still on the job training, we're, we're learning and I, I, I don't take it uh, lightly just coming to interview um, today. I don't, I can't tell you how many times I've prayed asking uh, Allah to bless me with the, you know, the, the, the perfection of his word, you know, bless me to represent him and his message in a way that, that he and his Christ and his Messiah may be properly known in the hearts of men. And I always say at the end of it, I ask this not for my own personal sake of grandizement, but so that you and your minister and your messenger will be properly known in the hearts of men. Not for me. For me. So um, the greatest thing is to um, that I've learned is to, to teach in a way that you're not trying to get people to be your student, but you're trying to get them to pull their desk next to yours and accept the same teacher you accepted. I want to talk about the famous book by Elijah Muhammad, How to Eat to Live. Um, where did Elijah Muhammad learn about food? And where did the idea to eat once a day come from? What a beautiful question. These two books, How to Eat to Live, book one and book two, these are the supreme nutritional guide for man. They really represent the uh, dietary owner's manual from God on how to get the best use out of this vehicle. And you look at the cover of it, he tells you where he got it from. From God in person, Master Father Muhammad. Think, oh, that's a bold statement. He's saying God taught him this, fulfilling what was written of him uh, in both Bible and Holy Quran. In the Holy Quran, in the third chapter, it says that when the last one comes that will be Messiah, he would do this. He would teach the Torah, that's the Old Testament, Gospel, the New Testament, the book, Holy Quran, and the wisdom. And he would teach you what foods to eat and what to store in your house. Jesus said it like this, I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Well, you can't have a may unless there's a program given and you follow it and you get life and life more abundantly, you don't follow it. So in it is, is the science of expression. When you unpack both those scriptures from the Bible and Quran, it's saying that the last message is going to teach you how to eat, to live. So he got it from God in person. And, and what he revealed to us over 90 years ago is now still unfolding and unpacking and people are starting to realize it to this day. So one meal a day was given to him by Master Fahd Muhammad. But a, the, the way that a student should be is that any time that a messenger makes a revelation, he doesn't have to give you an explanation, he gave you a revelation. Your job as a student is to go dig in to ask why and get the explanation. So we've been, as his students, uh, taking that body of knowledge going in to get the explanation that supports the revelation. And in even really white people all over the world are doing the same thing. 
So, so he said eat one meal a day. He said eating three meals a, a day will wear out the stunk, stomach of even a brass monkey, he said. Well, everybody thought that, you know, I'm supposed to be eating three meals a day. That's what I've been taught all of my, my life. And I even was told that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. The question is, is it in the scripture? Where'd you get it from? God didn't say it. Kellogg said it. And they were trying to get you to buy the cereal that they was producing. So, so when you go and look at the digestion, it takes 24 hours to digest one meal, to go from the uh, large to uh, intestine, small intestine, and to make it all the way out the system for the body to break it down and extract the benefit and get rid of the waste. It takes 24 hours to break down one meal. Well, that means that if I eat two meals, I'm living two days on the inside of my body and I'm only living really one. So I'm wearing out my system the more that I eat. He said eat one meal a day. What is he saying? It gives you a ch your body a chance to break down that meal, extract that which is tonic, healing and good for you, and also break down and discard that which is toxic. But if you eat three, now your body's still working on the tonic and the toxic from one, now you done slapped another meal on it. Now it's got to wrestle with the toxins from that. I can't get to all the toxins from the last meal because I'm working on this new. Then you come back with a snack. Then you come back. By the time we get finished with it, we are full of toxins. Uh, and we find ourselves suffering from illness and sickness unnecessarily. So the most honorable Elijah Muhammad was taught that uh, by God. Then he took it to another level. He said, you don't have to just eat one meal a day. He said, if you eat one meal a day and fast three days, out a month. He said, you'll hardly ever get sick. He said, but if you don't want to ever get sick, just eat one meal and then nothing the next day and then eat one meal every other day. Think about that. He said that at the most you may get sick once every two or three years. He said, but if you want to take it to another level, like the ancient patriarchs that lived to be a thousand years of age, did you know that that before Noah, all the way from Adam to Noah, the average life expectancy for man was 912 years of age. Regular years, the way we count them. Uh, Adam was 930 when he died. The oldest man in the scriptures named Methuselah, 969. How'd you live to be almost a thousand? He ate one meal, fasted three days, and then ate another meal. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, if you eat like that, you will never get sick. Your body will never have enough toxins to even make you sick. So uh, scientists are now bearing witness to it. You've seen them do these experiments uh, on, on uh, mice. And you know, the white man, he loves taking credit for everything. They call it the OMAD diet. OMAD is an acronym, one meal a day. It ain't, it ain't talking about no Neanderthal. It's talking about what they brought from the wisdom that God gave the honor of Elijah Muhammad that they want to take credit for. But that is the science uh, of it. And, and the better and more we bring our lives to be disciplined to it, the better we'll be uh, in health and spirit moving forward. And how was it for you initially transitioning to eat healthy when you started? Well, it's, it was a challenge because it's so much, it's more expensive. So, you know, I was used to, when we was coming up, we was used to going to Aldi's and just getting, you know, 600 cookies for $3. You know, frozen burritos from 20 for 27 cents a piece. And when I came up, I thought that Jesus sent Raymond noodles. I thought God brought these. I, had, I was getting them for 17 cents a pack. Oh, I thought this was from God. So I end up coming into the teachings and started to want to buy good produce, fresh produce, and heard the best of the fresh was organic. So I went to the store with my little basket to the health food store, and I'm used to pushing a whole cart at Aldi's, filling a whole cart up, my bill be $32. I got this little basket. I brought it up there, I'm saying, well, 30, $32 for a whole cart, it's gonna be about $9. Lady rung up all this organic stuff and told me 
It's going to be a hundred and some odd. I said, what? I said, never mind. I don't want none of it. And look what she said to me. She said, aren't you worth it? I said, man, I never looked at it like that. I said, well, give me half of it. I'm worth about $50 worth of it. But, but that, that was the, the, the challenge. And um, I can say that I still have not uh, mastered how to eat to live, but I'm striving uh, to do so. I, I first came in contact with the how to eat to live, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad made a statement. He said, inside of beef, there were 21 drugs pumped into to cows that were harmful to the human body. This was in the 60s. And he was saying that because these drugs are in the meat, that you become addicted to it. So before I even joined the nation, I was 16. I said, I'm just going to stop eating beef and see if I start craving it. I craved it for two years. Then I said, man, I wonder if chicken, same way. And I craved chicken for five years. So I said, it, it, is, it is true. So um, I end up becoming a vegetarian at the age of right before I turned 17. And I have been one now for 32 years. And I can say that I feel now at the age of 48 better than I felt at the age of 15 by following not even to the letter, not 100 percent, but following how to eat to live by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Have you went through periods where you ate one meal a day? I, I do that as a general rule. And I have done one meal every other day for a few years. How was that? It was it was challenging. Um, the first time I did it, I was. Uh, well, I wasn't really a vegetarian. I just was a dude that didn't eat meat. And there's a difference. <laughs> you can't you you can no, be no, you can, as a vegetarian mean you supposed to be eating vegetables. Bread but, and fries. Yeah, and but by this world, you can eat pizza and spaghetti every day and still be called a vegetarian. So the first time I did it, I wasn't eating like I should. The second time I was, I was doing it, I was training, uh, doing marathon training. So I was running 60, 70 miles a week and trying to eat one meal every other day. So it, uh, it became too taxing on my, my mind. I was, I was overworking myself. So I said, well, let me finish this marathon, uh, go back to one meal a day, and then I'm a, when I'm done with this training, I'm going to go back to one meal every other day. And I did not uh, return to it. But God willing, I'm going to get there uh, and then hopefully get to the discipline of just eating one meal and the, the, uh, every three days. One meal every other day, the day that you're not eating anything. I take it you can have just water. You can have like a smoothie or a fruit thing. Just water, just water and, a, and a little coffee or some tea. That was it. That's all that you eat throughout uh, you don't eat, but that's what you do. You just drink some water and coffee uh, throughout the day, and and you feel pretty good. You feel you you you're very clear, and you're non-distracted. You'll be surprised how much mental energy we waste figuring out what we're gonna eat, when we're gonna eat, where we're gonna eat, and then actually sitting down eating. When that's not on your mind, now you can focus on things that's more significant and important. And so I like now I have a little thing I've done. Um, I don't eat breakfast and lunch. I eat dinner. So I asked, what is the average? This was six years ago. What's the average cost that a person would spend eating lunch and breakfast at home? And the math come up, came up to about $15 a day. I said, so $15 a day, I have it in my account where I have a breakfast and lunch withdrawal come out of my account and I put it into a savings account. Do you know after a couple of years of doing this, I never even looked at the money. I was able to go buy a Jag cash, used one, then I sold it and then did it again and went and bought a Tesla cash from breakfast and lunch money. So not only does how to eat to live save your life, it also will save your money. And you'll be free to do with that money uh, other things. 
Imagine that. Now, if I go to one meal every other day, I can, I can add uh, another 15 to that, and now I'm doing saving probably $130, $140 a week. What could you do with the extra $520 a month over the course of a, a year, putting you at over $16,000? that you just put up just from being disciplined with your diet. So it saves your life, but it also saves your pocket too. Uh, for those who didn't hear it, just please tell us how many, I know you don't have to tell us the exact names, but just tell us how many uh, ingredients are in what you refer to as sick filet. Well, I was, it's a play on words, of course. And you know, you got to be black people. They didn't, they, they, when I said McDevils, everybody was like, ha ha ha. I said Taco Hill, ha ha ha. Uh, white casket instead of white castle, ha, ha, ha. Sin Tucky fried chicken, ha, ha, ha. That when I said Long John Killers, they was fine. When I said the Murder King, they was fine. But black people got an emotional attachment to this Chick-fil-A spot. So when I said sick filet, well, I had to get extra security. I'm t so I was sitting one day drinking some coffee and I was looking at the line at Chick-fil-A. Three lines starting at 10.30 in the morning and I stayed there for an hour. It never let up. I said, ain't no way in hell that a chicken sandwich tastes that good. So I said, let me see. Uh, I wonder what they putting in it. And I started doing the research right at the time that you remember, you know, in the hood there was this argument, Popeyes versus Chick-fil-A. And everybody was going back and forth. And people, you seen people at Popeye's, man, got shot. The man shot somebody because they didn't have no more chicken sandwiches left. I mean, I said, this, I said, this ain't no regular chicken sandwiches. So I went and looked up Popeye's chicken sandwich. Come to find out, they have 40, over 40 ingredients in the Popeye's chicken sandwich. 32 of them were man-made chemicals. And I said, well, let's see what Chick-fil-A has. Over 50 chemicals in the chicken sandwich, over 40 of them were man-made chemicals. I said, so hell, this is a dope sandwich. So they, hell, they really are flipping birds over there. <laughs> I mean, because there's no way in the world to justify. So whenever I seen that, um, I said it in a message. And someone took the clip of it and then went on the website of Chick-fil-A, had it broke down where they were clicking on it, showing all of the ingredients and these chemicals that were in it. Do you know the next day Chick-fil-A took that down off their website? So now you can't find the ingredients to the Chick-fil-A sandwich or the Popeye's uh, chicken sandwich because they don't want you to know that they're drugging you, that they're doping you. That, that they, are, they have you wanting the food, not be for nutrition or value, but because you become addicted by the MSG and the other chemicals that they've inserted in that also are immune system disruptors. They ill affect your brain, mess with your arteries, and, and any foreign substance automatically activates the immune system, which means our bodies, when we eat this kind of food, they're fighting an unnecessary battle. So when the real battles of disease show up, the, the systems are too worn out by fighting these small battles every day from bad eating that they can't handle a virus when it shows up. So it'll, it'll do us a great service. Uh, as the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said this, he said, you must get your mouth out of the white man's kitchen. And remember this, the minister said this, whoever controls your kitchen controls your revolution because food affects mood. We are what we think, but we also are what we eat. And if we have the wrong teacher multiplied by the wrong diet, we're going to engage in the wrong activity and success won't be ours. You have a quote that really sums up many of our brothers and sisters who struggle with self-worth. Uh, I heard you say once, one who thinks little of themselves thinks very little of their chances. Um, one, 
where are you getting these lyrics from? You make these up as you go, or are you like purposely trying to get them? It's accidentally on purpose. Yeah. But um, I, I'll just say this, that whenever you are a teacher, the best way that you can teach is the way you have to learn. And the way that I had, had to learn and have to learn is I have to, it has to have some kind of rhythm to it uh, that makes it easy for me to retain it and recall it. So because that's the way that I had to learn, I think by studying, I'm constantly always trying to put something into some rhythm or rhyme so that I can continue to know the reason. And as a result of that, it ends up uh, coming out uh, in, in the teachings. And for the most part, um, I'm learning now later in life that uh, almost all the great teachers always spoke in parables and metaphors because it allows you to make a simple statement that has more breadth and depth to it that you can say a little but still say a lot. So that's kind of, you know, the way it happened. That's why I said accidentally on purpose. I think that's just the way that God made my brain to learn. And I guess uh, many others' brains is the same because when I say it like that, people, they too retain it and it helps them as well. All right, cool. And I want to uh, touch on the quote in regards to uh, self-worth. It seems to be a humongous issue in our community, right? Um, people just don't believe they're worthy of anything. They don't feel they're worthy of success. We have a lot of self-sabotage in our community, right? Uh, what advice would you give to the viewers out there who are struggling with self-worth and struggle with believing that they can do great things? Well, again, we said it a little earlier, uh, something that we brought out to the, the brothers in the general penitentiary in Jamaica that, that had stick and stay with them. And I, and I was trying to inform them this. I said, do not allow your self-image or any other perceptions to be uh, given or taught to you by non-scriptural concepts. So when you think self-worth, self-worth has to come from what God said about you. And once you take on a scriptural concept of self, then you start saying, wait a minute, I'm in the image and the likeness of God. Well, if I'm in the image and likeness of God, that means that everything that's true about God is true about me. If I'm in the image and likeness of God, that means when God looks at me, he sees himself. Well, when I look at myself, I should see God. If I'm in the image and likeness of God, I'm not a duplicate of God, I'm a replica of God. Duplicate would just be image, meaning I look like, but replica, which means I look like in likeness, I, I got the power and the function of what I'm a copy of. So whatever God can do, I can do. So when you have that, that kind of self image and self concept, that produces self worth. Where we're going wrong is most people have mistaken self esteem for self worth. And there's a difference between self esteem and self worth. Self esteem is what you think about yourself based off of how other people see you. But self worth is what you think about yourself based off of what God said about you and how you see your own self. So once you come into uh, acceptance that I'm not accepting any other definition of myself other than a scriptural concept, what God said about me is true. And as long as I know I'm operating with integrity, with discipline, I'm doing the best that I, I can do, striving to be like him, then my self-worth is intact. The root of all of our crime, all of our problems is self-hatred. We've been head, fed a heavy diet of lies about the black man. And it's so scientifically that there, there is a synergism of, of subtle little things that mess, mess up black ability to see itself right. Just think about as children, two fairy. Think, look, little white girl. The rainbow shows up. We don't tell the child that the rainbow is the product of the sun that's 93 million miles away sending a ray of light 
at 186,000 miles per second, and it begins to penetrate one of the droplets of water that is in the cloud that was formed by the earth, uh, having its water pulled by the moon and gathering six miles above civilization. So whenever the 58 facets of light began to shine through the raindrop, it begins to reflect through the raindrop and produce something called a rainbow. We see a rainbow, so you know it's a leprechaun, a little white boy. So two fairy, little white girl, leprechaun, don't forget about Santa Claus. So the programming, how do you fall in love? Cupid, a little naked little white baby with some chicken wings on the back, shooting you with your arrow to make you fall in love. These are little, these are little uh, play stories that have a, have a, a real effect on our mind. Because the child now thinks love comes from white people, money comes from white people, gold comes from white people, all the gifts are going to come from them. Then you go and you read everything that the ad adjective black is attached to is always negative. Everything the adjective white is attached to is always positive. If you look it up in the dictionary right now, the word black has 120 negative names attached to it. But look up white. 34, all of them positive. Little white lie. See that? Bad guys in the, in the sh wear black. Funeral, black. But wedding, you wear white. Angel food cake, chocolate cake, chocolate icing. I mean, white cake, white icing. Devil food cake, chocolate cake, chocolate icing. Bad luck behind the eight ball. Eight ball, the black ball, last ball to go in on the table. You knock it in too early, you lose. What, what knocks all the other balls in? It's the white ball, it's the cue ball. It's bigger, heavier than all the other balls. It puts every other color ball in its place. See, these are subliminal programs. So by the time you get finished with folklore, language, and then multiply that by all the images of the messengers, the warners, the disciples, are all been painted white, then we, we've been fed self-hatred. So it makes it hard for us to believe in ourselves. So I challenge every black man, woman, and child to start reading about people that look like you, that accomplished great feats in the past. Because what happens is you activate your spiritual peripheral vision. See, physical peripheral vision says I'm looking at you, but I can see my brothers to, on both sides. I'm looking at you, but I can see the light here and I can see the TV over there. So spiritual peripheral vision means that the minute that I start looking at someone that accomplished great feats in the past, I began to say to myself, if they can do it, so can I. So that, that will help us uh, to do it. And then of course, taking the spiritual concept is the highest thing. You're not just the founder of Timbuktu, the builder of the Nile Valley civilization. You're not just the one that established the city of Atlantis. You're not just the one that built uh, uh, the pyramids. You are the fathers and mothers of all art, science, and civilization. We are the original people of the planet. Everything and everyone came from us. So once you accept that as your own personal self concept, that I'm not just an inventor or a conqueror, but I am a God, then your self-worth will stay high. And if your brother is your other self, he's a God too. So I'm going to look out for him the same way I would look out for God. And I'm going to look out for myself the same way I'm going to look out for God. I'm going to expect from myself what I expect from God. And when you operate like that, there's nothing you can't be, do, or have. You can be as powerful as you want to be, do whatever you want to do, and have whatever you want to have. If you see your self-image through scriptural lenses instead of non-scriptural concepts. And there's one more thing I want to touch on. Uh, thank you for giving advice on self-worth. Consistency. People yeah. struggle with consistency, and you know you need that to achieve anything. That's what right. advice would you give to people who, so they can just start and stay with it, bro? Because I give thanks to the people who start, right? But they get weeded out real quick because when things get a little rough, you know how that go. Well, it is it's the di discipline. See, what is discipline? The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said this. He says, self-discipline is self-love. And where there is no discipline, there is no love. 
So how do you prove you love yourself? You got to discipline yourself. What is discipline yourself? It's doing what you should do. When you should do it, whether you feel like doing it or not. See, self-discipline activates in your brain an override mechanism that whenever it's not fun anymore, it's not new, it don't feel good anymore, it still allows you to maintain an action until you reach your objective. Self-disciplined people, when you self-discipline, you don't quit when you're tired, you quit when you're done. So once you make your mind up, I put my word out here that I'm getting ready to make it happen. You got you to gotta, you gotta keep working until your word becomes flesh. And one of the things that we say, we say that word is bond and bond is life. And I shall give my life before my word shall fail. The question was asked, have you not learned your word should be bound regardless to whom or what? And we answer, yes. So any human being on earth is a whom? Any circumstance that could ever exist is a what? So if my word is going to be bound regardless to whom or what, and I'm willing to give my life before my word shall fail, once I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to be persistent and consistent until I get there or I'm going to be dead. That's the kind of commitment uh, that one has to, to, to express. And if we do that, uh, we'll find that it, it's, a, it's a lot easier to do it. I will give you just a little trick. When you have a go up goal, keep it to yourself. Because there's a whole lot of people that have already punked out on becoming good and great at whatever they're doing. And the minute that you talk to them about it, they're going to try to talk you out of it. So you have to be very careful sharing big ideas with small minded people. But when you have a give up goal, don't keep that to yourself. Tell everybody. See, if you say that, look, I'm letting y'all know from here on out, I'm giving up smoking weed. You tell all your partners, I ain't look, I'm letting y'all know I ain't smoking no more. See, right when you think about rolling that blunt, you know that it's a possibility, even if they're not around. I might see little John tomorrow and he going to ask, hey, how, how you coming? How you coming with, with, with uh, you're not, not smoking thing? And I don't want to be saying, oh, man, I didn't went on back and start smoking already. So the, when you have a go up, go keep it to yourself. But when you got to give up, go share it with other people. And what you'll find is that it adds willpower to your will because you don't want to be embarrassed in front of the people that you know, love, and respect. That, that will do it. And remember this, I, I mean, they got so many books on how to be successful. 48 laws of this, the 12 habits of this, the, the 10 rules of so forth, the 33 strategies of so, and it ain't but two rules of success. Get to it and stick to it. And if you get to doing it and you stick to doing it, at some point, you're going to make it happen. But you got to have the stick to itiveness to go with the get to itiveness if you want to get to where you're trying to get uh, in life. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to always be something you feel like doing. But do what you should do when you should do it, whether you feel like doing it or not. And it will activate overriding mechanism in your brain that will allow you to maintain an action long after the excitement has worn off. All right. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, relationship talk out there now, right? Especially in regards to black people. Question I have for you is, um, how do brothers become a good husband and father when they never saw or don't understand what a good husband or father is? Very good question. You know, we have a saying inside the ranks of the FOI that we mentioned, the military training of the men that belong to Islam in North America, that in order to be a man, you gotta meet a man. However, uh, you don't, that man that you meet doesn't have to be your biological father. That man that you meet doesn't have to be somebody that you actually shook his physical hand and seen him face to face. The man that you and I should meet is the supreme being himself. So if, we are created in the image and the likeness of God, then God is the example of manhood. 
So everything that you read about God, try to carry it into practice yourself. And the first phase of it, to make it simple, is as we share with the brothers in the penitentiary. Break that Lord's Prayer down. There was a sister that asked the minister a question one day. She said, uh, how will I know a real man when I meet one? And the minister said, easy sister, just study the Lord's Prayer. That is a description of what a real man looks like. So once you take that Lord's Prayer and you break that down into manhood traits, you'll find that that will make you able to meet not a man, but the man, God himself, and you can become uh, much greater of a man than what you may have seen growing up uh, in your environment. Scripture says Jesus didn't have a biological father in his life but look how great of a man he became connecting to a spiritual father. The minister never met his father before, but look how great of a man he became by meeting a spiritual father named the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I never was able to know my father and meet my father. I met him once or twice when I was 17, once when I was 31, but I've only seen him and talked to him a couple conversations in life, but I met a man in the minister that met the, a man in the honor of Elijah Muhammad that met God. I have a quick question, right? Uh, working with teenagers, I know this, teenagers who don't grow up around, a, not the father, but just a strong man, struggle with interacting with a strong man. Um, so because you didn't grow up around your father, how was your relationship or how did you respond to strong men initially? I think that I... Um, I wanted to be one, so I never shunned it, you know. And growing up, of course, there was always uh, people that dominated in the environment, whether it was in sport, physical strength, uh, hustling, intelligence, whatever it was. And, and you should, or and I thought I did, I'd always observe. You know, I like that about Brother So, this best brother, he's solid in this area. Weak in that area, but solid in that area. I'm going to try to be solid like that. So, so we've learned something. There's a chapter in the Quran, the 16th chapter. It's called the bee. And really, the way a bee develops honey is the way that a man can become a real man. See, the bee lands on flowers in different environments and extracts the best from each of those flowers called pollen. Then it takes the best from each flower it lands on, marries it with the best within itself, then spews it into its own comb, and we eat it, and it's called honey, and we get energy, nutrients, and healing from it. So it is with a man. You don't have to have that one man, but you should see enough strong men and land on them like a bee extract the best that each man has to offer, marry it with the best in yourself, and then give yourself back to the world, and you might find yourself a source of energy, a source of strength, and a source of healing uh, to your people. So that, that's the kind of mentality. So if you, you know, there's a scripture that says God did not create man in the spirit of timidity. He created man in the spirit of power, Love. Some translations say sound mind and some say self-discipline. But you need self-discipline to even have a sound mind. So if we're created in the, in, in the nature of power, love, and self-discipline, not created to be timid, then once, once you know that yourself, no matter what age you are, you can't operate uh, like that. You can't operate where you are tucking your tail and putting your head down everywhere you go. You should be up looking around, trying to absorb the best you can from everybody in your environment, incorporating it within the best within you so that you can become the strong solid man compiled of all the ones you, you've met. So there's so many strategies, so many methods that can be employed for us to be made into what we are supposed to be. But we have to take charge of our own posts.
and be conscious about becoming, a, you know, as they say, a ten toes down, stand up, solid man. And at the end of the day, whether you meet a man or not, there's a built-in self-validation system inside of man. You, you, you judge yourself off of who you are, what you do, and how much you make doing it. And, and you know, even if you're faking on social media, you know whether or not you're successful. You know, no matter how tough you act, if you're a coward. So, so once you start looking in your mirror and you know that I am solid, I am courageous, I am intelligent, I am uh, moral, I do have principles, I'm doing something that's honorable, I'm not lying, stealing, cheating, or selling nothing illegal, I'm doing an honorable work, and now, what else? How much do I make doing it in comparison to other people that is doing it? Now, I got something to work toward to determine my success. Once you activate that system, and it's gonna be activated, and once you start matching it, you'll, you'll feel good about yourself and be able to be that man you wanna be. You brought up a great point. I think that's why a lot of men struggle internally, because they know they're lying to themselves. Yeah. So they don't have that fulfillment. And they don't have that strength, you know? So, um, and I wanted to, there's another one I want to add on here too. Please provide our viewers with a condensed version of the mathematical formula for the formation of relationships in your book before I say I do. Oh, Lord. Condensed version. Get this lot, version. Get this so, version. Yeah, yeah. Number one, mate selection. So, you, you know, every species that exists uh, goes through a mating process that is optimal to that species. You don't see stallions marrying donkeys. Even among the dogs, horses, the chickens even, that whenever they're breeding, they're mating them, they're looking for DNA. They're looking for certain characteristics before they do it. The minister gave a simple formula once on how you can determine compatibility uh, male to female, female to male. He said, make a list of what you think an ideal man looks like as a woman. Same, do the same. Make a list of ideal woman as a man. And then when you are interviewing someone you think is that one, see if they meet up to 70% of what you're looking for in a man or woman that you call an ideal mate for you. If they meet up to 70% of that, you see that there's compatibility there. You can work on the other ones. Problem with us is that we have our definition and concept of an ideal woman or ideal man. We talking to somebody, they only meet up to three and are missing seven. And we think that we're going to put a certain kind of food loving and good good on them and they shazam, I'm going to make him into this. And we found out that it doesn't work. So, you know, if you marry someone that got 70% of what you're looking for already present in the person and the other 30% is potential, you got your partner. But if you marry someone that has 30% present and the other 70% is potential, you don't have a partner, you got a project. And you're not supposed to marry a project, you're supposed to marry a partner that helps you with some projects. So that's phase one. Phase, phase two, remember, whatever you do to get a thing, you have to do to keep it. So courtship before marriage has to continue to become courtship after marriage if you really want to be able to keep the one that you want. Number three, remember this, remember this. They did a study of couples around the world that had been happily married for over 65 plus years, trying to figure out what was the secret that, that had them together that long and happy. And what they found is that friendship is the longevity ingredient that keeps people together. So you have to have somebody that you call a mate that you don't just love, that you also like, that makes you laugh, that makes you happy, that you like being around. Uh, and then last but not least, I used to do a little joke with some of the workers uh, in our complex. And I would always tell them, you know, you was just talking to your husband, wasn't you? You was just talking to your wife. And they would always say, yeah, how, how did you know? Because you was cold, mean, and short. Ain't that something? <laughs> Most people talk nicer to strangers 
and customers than they do to their own mate. So all of the workers, when a customer called, when a brother came to the door, sister, yeah, it's all kind, considerate, patient, with a good tone. But when you talk, no, yeah, that didn't. That's what I said, didn't I? All right. <laughs> Talking to your husband, what? Yeah, how did you know? Cause you was cold, meaning short. So we've got to. The minister said like this: We have to create a revolution of kindness in the ghetto, and it starts. Charity begins at home. So let's start. Uh, being kind to each other. Let's not just love each other. Let's like it. Let's be friends. Let's be friends. And let's make sure that before we decide to say I do, that we actually got compatibility. We marry in a partner, not a project. And if we do that, I think that, that we'll have a much greater success than what we have right now because it is an epidemic right now. The minister said this once. He said the number one threat to our national security as a people is divorce. 75% divorce rate, black people in America. L listen to me, that's worse than any third world nation on earth. You telling me people can stay together with no running water, living in mud huts, and we can't even stay together with all that we have access to with knowledge, wisdom, amenities, and food? Something, no, we, we, we got to get back to the original value system that, that we once had that caused us when we said, rich or poor, better or worse, sickness and health, to death do us part, our word was bond. Right now our word is blonde, this recessive and weak. We gotta get back to making it bond again. But I think it'll be easier if we're kind, if we're friendly to each other, if we really uh, are looking for compatibility and we have our list, not physical traits, but starting them off with spiritual traits, personality traits. And if you want to put some physical stuff at the bottom, that's fine. But your definition of an ideal man or woman should start off with spiritual traits, personality traits that match the kind of person you are. And then you can put some of the other stuff that's less important at the bottom of your list. And if we did that, I think we'd be able to have in the black community more happily ever after than we have right now. And uh, you can speak on this because you've been married for a long time. I've been 10 years, so that's rookie status for you guys. Uh, right? 10 years is good, yeah, though. It's so, a decade, yeah. though. So um, uh, let people know about how you deal with the transitions because you've changed dramatically from you first met till now and also your spouse. And I think that that change during a relationship is what puts the nail in the coffin for most people. They're not accepting of the change or the growth of the person. So what advice would you give to someone experiencing that to where they're not even necessarily growing apart, but they are growing and they may not be the person that they met initially. Well, if you go together, you should grow together. So why am I growing and you're not growing? You know, what kind of household? Do you know the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said this? He said, it is in the nature of the woman to want to equal herself up to her man. So the only way that that kind of growth the opposite direction is going is if two people are not growing up vertically toward greater expressions of self and oneness with God. But if that man is growing, it is in the nature of the woman to want to equal herself up to the man. She's going to want to keep on going and growing with you. So if you go together, you should be growing together. If you're growing apart, maybe both of y'all headed the wrong direction. So are you all striving to become one with God? If you are, you, sh you should be headed for the same destination. But are you trying to be something that you see uh, existing in the world that may be abstract to what is moral, what is right, and what is correct for man and woman? Then you'll start saying that we're growing apart because you're going horizontal. But if your mind is bent on going, growing vertical, y'all should be on the journey together. And if you are the man and you are setting that pace she naturally is going to equal herself up to you. Go together. You should grow together. Please speak about how the presence of the Nation of Islam in prisons has both helped and hurt the Nation of Islam brand. Well, it hasn't hurt the Nation of Islam brand. It's helped us. See, the, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said this. He said, my best followers are in the streets. And that could mean two different things. One 
it could mean that they're still out there and we need to go get them and bring them. But also, what is a street person? When you say that so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so always been a street dude, you're talking about somebody that's been in the streets hustling, gangbanging, etc. Well, if his best followers are in the streets, and generally someone in the streets, consequences is incarceration, then inside the belly of the beast is some of the best followers. So prison, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us, can either be one or two things. It could either be a tomb or a womb. Tomb meaning it kills you when you go in. Womb meaning it brings birth to a new you. Well, even though they call it the Department of Correction and some call it a reformatory, there ain't no correcting or reforming going on from the administrative staff or the curriculum that they give you in jail. The only brothers that meet reform and have character correction generally are those who get connected to the nation of Islam. So those brothers that are in the belly of the beast, they're some of the best followers that we could ever be looking for. They are the ones that were in them streets. And it's something about a man that's willing to kill and die over dope in a color or a block. Man, you willing to kill and die for nothing, what will he do for something? That makes him a great soldier. So we love that brand of black man that's, that's inside the belly of the beast because he generally comes from that cloth that we would call the potential best followers. The only negative I would say is that the bourgeois, educated, professional class of our people like to limit the nation of Islam's power to reform to just former drug dealers, former gang bangers, prostitutes, and brothers in jail. But I beg your pardon, brother or sister bourgeois, you need the teachings just as bad as the brother in jail needs it, and maybe even more. So this teaching is not just for the recovering drug addict or the gangbanger or the brother locked up. It's for every last one of us because all of us are bound to some kind of vice or incarcerated to something. So, so with that concept, the negative is, is that we, we become uh, to them yeah, the nation is good for those people, but not me, I'm Dr. So-and-so. Not me, I'm lawyer so-and-so. No, you need the civilization and the teachings of knowledge of God, self, time, and what must be done, and the devil. You need it just as bad as the brother that, that's in the hood, too. So in that sense, don't allow yourself to limit the nation to just recruiting street people. No, from the streets to the suites, it's the nation of Islam. And in a nation, you got all types of people. So we need the doctor to be on the battlefield. We need the lawyer to be in the ranks too. We need the chemist in the ranks and we need the killer and we need the hustler. We need all of them uh, under this umbrella if we're gonna be a nation of Islam. And, uh I gotta throw this in there too. I remember there was a period in the '90s where the nation seemed very uh, influential on rappers, right? Um, is there any strategy now to connect with entertainers, or is this something that just you just allow to happen naturally? Well, the strategy was employed to disconnect them from us. See, the in the '90s there was an alliance that was made without the permission of the industry between the nation of Islam and the black artists. When we were coming up, when I was a child in the 90s, all the main hip hop stars were rapping conscious. So there was the brand Nubians, it was the Poor Righteous Teachers, it was Ice Cube, it was Arrested Development, it was X-Clan, it, it was Queen Latifah, it, it, black, black was, it was in. So whenever the enemy seen that, wait a minute, this is not just some mumbo jumbo over top of some stolen instrumentals from jazz beats. This hip hop thing really has sway over people and can shape and mold public opinion. 
they can create a revolution with this rap. So they seen that as the dominant artists had an alliance with consciousness and the nation, they seen a transformation taking place among black people. People, black people wasn't eating no pork. X caps everywhere, African medallions everywhere, brother and sister. Everybody was talking about struggle, freedom, independence, doing for self. And they knew that they couldn't allow that to remain in existence. So they hijacked uh, conscious, inserted gangster. Now you got drill and selling dope, womanizing and, and abusing and verbal pornography is the new style of music now. Why? Because they know music is the most effective teacher on the planet. Ain't nothing more effective of teaching than music. The minister said this. He said, one good rap song is worth more than a thousand of my speeches. How did you learn your ABCs? Next time, won't you sing with me? Music has always been the most effective teacher. So they seen the most effective teacher being used to build black people up and make them conscious, sober, clean, lovers of one another. An alliance of the nation of Islam was there because you didn't get blacker than the nation. So they said, we got to make sure that we get rid of that. So it wasn't, it was natural. It was an organic alliance. We had this new thing with this uh, verbal pornography and this bragging about not just selling dope, but using dope. Come on, man. This is, this is all by design. And this is the inorganic unnatural conspiracy to hijack a medium that could have transformed our people overnight. So that helped us. That helped us because everywhere you went and turned on hip hop that you like, you heard something about Muhammad. You heard the minister inserted in it. Public Enemy was saying, Farrakhan's a prophet that I think you ought to listen to. Don't tell me that you understand until you hear the man. Even Outcast said, read your Bible and Quran, believe in the nation of Islam. Let's think about that kind of stuff. So, so because of that, that alliance, people were out in the real world saying, man, I ain't gonna never be outcast. I can't be public enemy, but I need to plug into what they plugged into. So we start seeing that uh, great influx of soldiers come in the ranks. They didn't like that. They didn't like the transformation taking place in the black community. They didn't like the cleaning of our diets, respecting our women, doing for self instead of trying to get a job with them. They didn't like that. So they hijacked hip hop and they've turned it into what it is right now that is facilitating the madness that exists uh, among our people right now. Condolences, all right, for those who don't know uh, your daughter transition, uh, can you share I spoke to Styles P. He, he experienced the same situation. Can you just share how you've been dealing with it and advice to anyone who else has experienced that? Well, you know, it's, it's the, the greatest challenge of life. You know, there's no parent that does not operate with the goal of giving their life for their child. Somebody comes in your home to do harm, you be willing to fight the one with the weapon, just to give your son or daughter a few extra minutes to get out the window to get down the street. We, we, we prepare ourselves to give our life for them. Uh, so when one, when it's, uh, if it's unnatural for your child to leave before you leave, especially uh, when the circumstances are the way that they were, you know, it hurts. So you, you know, I'm navigating with a broken heart still. And uh, there are very, uh, there's a lot of moments where I don't feel too good about it. And I, you know, I miss her every day and think about her every day. But what consoles the mind of one that has lost someone is to know this, that no soul dies, but by Allah's permission. He could stop anything from happening. So there's a reason why he didn't. And he may know. He does know, but we don't know. And I've learned this, my brother 
and I share this with anyone that suffers this kind of loss, gratitude is the anesthetic for grief. The more grateful we are for whatever time and experiences we were blessed with, the less we grieve. So as time goes on, in the beginning, every memory felt like a knife in your heart. It hurt. But as time goes on, every memory, now you know that's all you have. It begins to translate into joy and sunshine uh, in your heart. So that's, that's the great uh, anesthetic for grief. It gets rid of the pain, is being grateful. None of us did anything to earn our own life. The Bible says that in Jeremiah, I knew you before you were in the womb of your mother and I formed you in your mother's womb. Holy Quran doesn't give no credit to mothers and fathers except for being a seed planter and an environment that grew the seed. It says, I, Allah, created you in the womb of your mother. So all of us came from him out of his beneficence. None of us earned our own life, and we didn't earn the life of the ones that we say we love. So my daughter, I'm, I have to be thankful for the 21 years that I was able to get with her and the memories that we were able to share. But, of course, it does hurt. You know, still, but I promise you to know that, that it is the irrevocable will of God. No soul dies without his permission. And then to use that gratitude as the anesthetic and to be grateful for the time that you had and so many beautiful lessons that you can learn from everybody you meet, including your children. That now you have to carry them into practice with their image on your mind. And when you do so, they're not dead. They're alive in you. Did that experience shake your faith or change your perspective about life? It did not, uh, in, not in that sense. It did not make me, you know, people kept calling and asking, you know, telling me just, you know, whatever it is, just know, just know that I know that Allah is God, but don't, don't question, don't think that he don't know. I never thought anything about Allah or God making a mistake. I knew that he's the best knower, and it, and it never shook my faith in, in that sense. I did and do wish it would be different and would want it different, et cetera, but I know it's a bigger why, and I was able to learn that bigger why from the minister, and ultimately, as time goes on, it will show and prove uh, itself to be what it, what it is for. So it is, I never did have it. I can say this, that any uh, loss of someone like that, it could affect your health in a way that some of my family thought they were having a heart attack. Stress and anxiety, right. And they would have to go in. And you know what we found? There's something called broken hearted syndrome. I, I always thought that that just was a, a mythological concept, but some things can hurt you so bad mentally and spiritually that it affects you physically. So you feel it in your heart the same way someone feels a heart attack. It is literally a broken hearted syndrome. So, you know, those kind of things I experienced then and still sometimes do experience uh, now where I can feel my chest or my heart hurting physically from just, you know, wishing things were and wishing she was here. She was born on my birthday. See, that was my birthday gift. And the best birthday gift I could have ever asked for was a child. So we had, a, you know, a different kind of connection than some parents would have with their child. It was on a, it was a little bit higher level of that. So those, those kind of things, they, uh, they trouble you. But at the end of the day, I know what she loved, and she loved the nation. She loved black people. She wanted to see black people healed and wanted to see us free from the pain of life. So I fight that battle 
And, and I think about her uh, while I'm fighting that battle. And I feel like she's there all the time. So that's hopefully anyone suffering from it will, will use some of these uh, little strategies to help keep yourself sane and balanced and still working to fulfill what God wants you to fulfill and, and not lose yourself because of a loss.